as you bring God's work to us tonight. Amen. Good day. And like daddy will say, let somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank God for um, another convention and all the word of God that has been coming to us from the various speakers that God has sent to us during this convention. My prayer is that all of the blessings that God has planned for us, uh, each one of us will gain maximally from it and our lives will not be the same after this convention in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, I want to thank God for all of you who are able to make the convention this year and thank God for the privilege also for us to share the word of God together again as we sit together. I will not fail to thank God also for Pastor and Mrs. Uh, Astro, particularly uh, Mommy Pastor, Sister Desola, with whom we've been acquainted right from our campus days. And I'm grateful to God for this fellowship that we keep sharing. Thank you. God bless you. Let's pray together as we go into God's word. Father, again tonight, as we come to the uh, first message for this Holy Ghost service, and while we are expecting the Lord to minister to us again as our daddy will come with the main message tonight. Father, please speak to us. Please touch our heart. Prepare our heart to receive your blessings. Make us, uh, take us to a dimension that your, your mercy, your miracles, your blessings will freely locate our life. While we are expecting the Lord to minister to us again as our daddy will come with the main message tonight. Father, please speak to us. Please touch our heart. Prepare our heart to receive your blessings. Make us uh, take us to a dimension that your, your mercy, your miracles, your blessings will freely locate our lives. Thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Amen and amen. Now, we are. our theme is the king is coming. And yesterday, we spoke on while the king is coming. What do we do while the king delays his coming as it were, and we are supposed to wait for him while we are, are, are awaiting the coming of the king. Tonight, I'm going to now speak on the topic, the king is coming. Yesterday, we established from the scriptures. In this short time, we are going to be looking at the fact that the king is coming and the implication of it for our lives. Even though God is a loving God, is a wonderful God, and each one of us seated here, we are recipients of his mercy. And I dare say there is none of us sitting down here who has not received at least, you have not experienced at least a miracle in your life since you gave your life to Christ. Even before we were born again, we see God in his sovereign mercy, reaching out to us, blessing us, allowing his grace to work on our behalf. Nevertheless, there are other issues in the gospel. There are other issues in the word of God that a, a serious person who is really wanting to get the best of God must not be oblivious of and must not push aside. One of it is what we are dealing with in this convention. The king is coming. You remember yesterday we read several scriptures that established the fact that even though it's looking as if Jesus will not come again, it may look as if Jesus is not going to come again. After all, we've been talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for several years. Many preachers have preached this. They have preached it until they died preaching this. I think either this year or last year, 
uh, one of the greatest evangelists that ever lived in our time and all eternity, Billy Graham, who has witnessed over one billion conversions to Christ, kept preaching until the last moment he died, and Jesus has not yet come. Several preachers, several prophets, many people have come, and they have said the king is coming. Jesus is coming back again. Jesus is coming soon. It has become such a slogan that it has become one of those things that we hear all the time. You say, oh, uh, Jesus is coming. You better, so that don't allow this, Jesus to catch this with you. And somehow, it is going back into the recesses of our consciousness. It's no longer on the front burners, like we normally say, because it looks as if everything is just keep, keeps going the way it used to be. And you are not the first to feel like that. You are not the first to think that the Lord delays his coming. And you are beginning to doubt. Will Jesus come? Let's look at the scriptures. For example, if you go to 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, from verse 3 to verse 10, I will run through it. We'll look at them quickly and we'll be jumping as usual in and out of this scripture and some other scriptures while we uh, quickly get to the point of praying tonight. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. What's the meaning of scoffers? Mockers. Those who make fun, who make jest. And they are walking after their own loss. What do they mean by that? They are walking, their interest is after their own cravings. The word lost is a strong desire. A, a, a personal, selfish desire for something. That's what people will be pursuing. And if you look at our, our time today, it looks as if that everybody is pursuing what he wants. Everybody wants to be great. Everybody wants to be famous. Everybody wants to be, to be rich. It's all about me and me and me. And unfortunately, even in church, when we come to God, that seems to be the topic. How we are going to become a millionaire? How you are going to become the greatest? How you are going to become the most famous? How you are going to read? How your millions are going to drop you? Personal, selfish desires. The Bible calls them loss. Strong cravings of the heart. Why? Because, look at what they say. And they are saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Excuse me, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. That's what you have been saying when I was a small baby. I became somebody like me personally. I was a teenager when I gave my life to Christ. And the way the message came that time, we thought Jesus was going to come immediately. Thank God that advised us. Some of us did not even want to go to school. I remember an aunt of mine that gave his life to Christ and was on the campus. She was reading chemical engineering. She would have been one of the, in fact, she would have been the first female chemical engineer graduate in Nigeria. But because of the message of uh, Jesus is coming soon, Jesus is coming soon, in the mid, I think she was at 300 level, one or two years more to go, while she withdrew from the university and said, the time is wasting. What am I, what am I going to school for? Jesus is going to come. Let me go and preach the gospel. And then there was a, another thing that time. We didn't believe in prosperity. The church at that time did not know that it was possible to be holy and be prosperous at the same time. So she said, even if I graduate as chemical engineering, I'll become too rich. I will, I'll be susceptible to temptation. I will not make heaven. That's how she passed out of the university and was preaching the gospel. She's still alive today. Jesus is not yet back. Unfortunately, she did not graduate as a chemical engineer because she thought that the, the kingdom of God was going to immediately appear. You know, that's the problem. The king is coming, the king is coming becomes dangerous because in our mind, our thoughts think, if they say the king is coming, then we are looking over our shoulders. Is he already on the way? 
If he's already on the way yet, I will I will prepare for his coming. But if he's not going to come yet, why am I struggling to to keep his standards? Why am I struggling to live a holy life? When the king is not going to come yet, to that the first thing is that you have become a scoffer, you have become a mocker, you have become somebody who does not believe, somebody who is making fun of the word of God, somebody who is making fun of the gospel. And maybe you are listening to me tonight. You have had messages, you have had preachers, you have had appeals. Our Father in the Lord, all our pastors, they have preached, give your life to Jesus, become born again, break away from your sins. Like the message came to, uh, I think it was Nebuchadnezzar, I said, break your sins with righteousness. Make a departure from your life of sinful exploits. But the way you react is that, guys, come off it. That's how you guys have been preaching for years. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. You guys are just carrying us. I gave my life to Christ as a teenager. That's several decades ago. And right now, I've already, I've counted five, six decades. And Jesus is not yet back. And you are beginning to wonder, is Jesus going to come again? The king is coming, the king is coming. Is this not a mirage that was sold to us by people who just want to keep us in bondage and they don't want to express ourselves? God has already, the Bible has already prophesied that in the last days, people are going to get to that point. It was not happening in the days of Peter, but Peter being a prophet could see into the future, and he can see people like you and I. One day I was sitting down watching CNN. I was just watching uh, uh, this international, and I was watching news, I was watching feature uh, magazine programs, and I, I sat down there, I don't know what happened to me, I sat down there for almost an hour, just going from one place to another and all of that. I, I guess I was just trying to relax. But then, as I, I watched program after program, the news keep run, running, the feature articles, the, the, the analysis of events keep going. It just occurred to me that those who are behind this programming, they do not have an understanding that Christ can come any moment. In their mind, the analysis is as if life is going to continue the way it is. There's no preparation. And if you are absorbed in the media, you are absorbed in social media, you are absorbed even in the contemporary media, the likely thing is that your mind is going to set you to say all these things about Jesus coming is just a figment of some people's imagination. I have good news for you. God already foresaw that there will be people like you at this time. So there will be scoffers in the last days, walking after, and because you think, since Jesus didn't come quick, let's push him aside. Let me pursue my own desire. Let me pursue what I want. Let me pursue the cravings of my heart. Look at what the Bible says. He said, verse 5, he said, for this, they are willingly, uh, for they willingly are ignorant of the fact that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water in the water, whereby the world that was then was being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, uh, which are now by the same word, were kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodliness. What is all that King James talk about? He was referring to incidents in the past. He said, you are like those people, those ignorant people who do not know God's plan and God's way of doing things. Simply because the master has not come, the king has not come as quickly as you thought, you can decide to push him out of your mind. You have become willingly ignorant that the kind of scenario we are facing now has happened before. And it was referring to the days of Noah. Do you remember in the days of Noah? That's how the righteous Noah was preaching the gospel. Repent. The rain is going to fall. People say, Alpha. Have you ever seen that rain before? Do you know if you read your Bible? It has never rained like that on the earth before Noah. All they had was a mist that waters the earth. 
There had never been rain. Nobody has seen rain before. And this man kept preaching. He is going to rain. He's going to rain. He's going to be a flood. God is going to wipe out everything. And the Bible said he preached for a hundred years. I am just wondering. Saying the same thing for 100 years and no single drop of rain fell from the heavens. I want you to think about it. We've been preaching that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming back to take his own and he's coming to reward the sinners with punishment for their sin. But nothing has happened for 20 years, for 30 years, for 40 years. Some of you listening to me, you're already in your 60s, you're already in your 70s, and you've been hearing Jesus is coming right from when you were in Sunday school. You were less than 10 when you have been hearing Jesus is coming. There's likelihood for you to become a scoffer at heart. There's every likelihood for you to not to throw away the fact that Jesus is coming. Yeah, I, I mean, that is reasonable. That's how it happened in the days of Noah. Let me read for you. Let me just run, rush and read uh, something quickly. Luke chapter 17. Like in the days of Noah, that the man here is alluding to. Are you in Luke chapter 17 from verse 20 to verse 30? Luke 17, 20 to 30. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. You can't sit down and be studying it to find it out. That's not how it's going to come. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. First and foremost, the understanding of the kingdom of God is wrong. But we don't have time to look at it because we just want to establish the fact that whether the master delays or not, whether the king has come quickly or he doesn't come quickly, he is going to come. He is certainly, as certain is certain, he is on his way. The king is coming. And look at the Bible saying, he said, For as the lightning that lighted out of one part of heaven and shines to the other part of heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. In other words, the coming of the Son of God is not going to be a hidden event. It's not going to be something that somebody is going to be reporting. Ah, it happened. Every eye we see it. Everybody will do it. It will happen in such a manner that everybody will watch it happen. When I used to read this as a young Christian, I used to have, how can this be? If something happens in Israel, how can those of us in Africa see it? If it happens in America, how will those of them in China see it? But now you, all of us know. Look, I'm sitting down talking to you somewhere in, in, my, in the comfort of my studio in Africa. But you're watching me live in Australia. And that's an indication that the, every eye we see it. Can you imagine? I watched almost live. I watched 9-11 as a young man. I saw the, 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 the cameras caught it. <laughs> I mean, they were not expecting it to happen. It's not as if they are, they are sitting down waiting for it, but the cameras caught it. The, every, within minutes, it was watched all over the world. And yet, for the case of the Son of Man, it will be watched live. How is it going to happen? Technology inclusive, everything. Don't worry about it. You will see it. As the lightning comes from one part of heaven and goes to the other, that's how it's going to happen. You are going to see it as a part and parcel of that event. But first, the Son of Man will suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. For as it, as it was in the day of Noah, are you following me? Verse 26. Luke chapter 17, verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. I hope you are understanding. You are following me now. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire 
and brimstone from heaven and destroy them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. May God bless his word to our heart. I hope you are following. Excuse me. Nothing is going to change. The world is going to keep going. Technology is going to keep increasing. There will be new inventions, new arrangements, new alliances, wars here. Yeah. The, you are going to keep the world is going to keep going the way it is going to keep coming. There's not going to be a special thing that is going to make us to know that ah, we better get ready. The king is coming. No, the king is going to come in the midst of normalcy. It's going to come in the in the midst of the world continuing the way it has always been continuing. They will be buying, they will be selling, you will be buying stock, you will be changing. Uh, the stock market report, uh, weather report, all the things that we keep, everything will continue as normal. Suddenly, the king will return. It's going to be like in the days of Noah. That man preached for 100 years. Nobody repented. He could only get this, his own household into the ark. Even the day when the rain was going to come, and God told him and said, now it's time. You have finished building the ark. I don't know how many years it took him to build the ark. Just imagine a preacher building a boat, a ship, on dry land. Everybody will look at him and say, this man has gone bonkers. That's how we see to you. When we tell you Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, he's coming out of the sky. He's going to rule the world. He's going to come back in the rapture first and take us away from here. We sound like storytellers. We look like, what are, you, what are you guys talking about? That's not scientific. That's not, it's not contemporary. I agree. That's how it was in the days of Noah. This man finished building the ark and God told him to enter the ark. He entered the ark with his children and they locked the door. I'm just imagining what their neighbors will be thinking. This guy has gone bonkers. But then after they entered that ship, the Bible says God shut them in. God closed the gate. Now, that's what's going to happen. First, before fire will come to destroy this earth, God will take away his own beloved. He did it in the days of Noah. He did it in the days of Lot. He's going to do it again. God, Jesus said, that's the way he's going to see my own people who follow me, who believe me, and who live a life worthy of me, they will be taken away first before everything is destroyed. And that's why we know that the rapture will come first before the second coming when everything is going to be wiped away. The rapture will come first. God will take away his own beloved. He will take away his righteous people from the earth. Just the same way he took Noah out, locked him in the boat. He took Sodom, um, Lot out of Sodom before fire came down. That's the way it's going to be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. My message is not supposed to be long today because it's just to prepare your heart to know that, excuse me, walking after the cravings of your heart will not prepare you for the coming of the King. The world system now is arranged and they keep taunting you. They keep propelling you. Go for it. Whatever you want, you can become it. That's the American dream. That's the dream of almost all the nations. Become what you want to become. Dream a big dream. Go and fulfill it. Pursue it. You will get it. That's the drive that will keep people working and they will be oblivious when it is time up for the king to arrive. Just like in the days of Noah. They married, they gave a marriage, they built their house, they sold and bought. I know you are saying you are buying, you are doing this, you are, you are going here, you are going there, because you. everybody seems to have forgotten that Jesus is coming back soon. And he will come back soon. They ate, they drank, they built, it, they bought, they sold. They changed, they did many things. They are doing mortgage and paying it off and buying a house and changing it. Things are going to continue as normal when suddenly the king will come like lightning from one part of heaven 
to, add to the other part. Permit me to go back to that second Peter chapter 3 before I bring you to the point of rain tonight. Look at that second Peter chapter 3. We read it. That the, those people were scoffing. When we when we Jesus come, all this talk about Jesus is coming is just in uh, some people who just like to scare us for nothing. I'm too strong for that kind of thing. Congratulations. When Jesus comes, you will, you will see what will happen. Look at what is happening. He said, but beloved, look at verse 8 now. I read up to verse 7 the other time. Verse 8 says, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards world, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why is the Lord delaying his coming? Yes, the king is coming. But why? Why do the heavens keep retaining him? Why is God? Push, pushing away, pushing forward, pushing, begging, creating more space, more time before Jesus is coming. Very simple. He doesn't want you to perish in your sin. He just wants to give you a longer rope to pull. He's giving you more time in hope that you will repent, in hope that you will turn around and respond to him. He's been challenging you. He has sent preachers to you. He has sent people to talk to you. You have watched on television. You listen to it on the internet. He has made all effort bombarding your life with challenges to repent, to turn around to follow God. But you keep going, keep going with the normal trend, going with the things that are trending. You are pursuing every factor. You are pursuing every craze that you find everywhere. God is saying, how I wish you will repent. How I wish you will turn around. I don't want this destruction to catch you on our way. That's the reason. God is not slack concerning his promise. It is his mercy that keeps pulling the time back, that keeps restraining himself. Say, don't let Jesus go first. Because when the king arrives, the game is over. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men, it's not as if God is sloppy. It's not as if God doesn't have a sense of timing. No, it's not that he doesn't know. But why has he arranged it this way? Let many more people get born again. Let many more people surrender their lives to Jesus. Let many more people become disciples, following Jesus in his footsteps. I know you have probably also raised your hand and you have come out for another call. You say you are born again, but you are still pursuing the passions of your heart. You are not living like Jesus will want you to live. Your, your decisions are not based on what the kingdom of God wants in your life. You are not one of those who are establishing the kingdom of God by your lifestyle, by the way you live, by the way you relate, even though you claim to be born again. Jesus is saying, when are you going to turn away from your sin? When are you going to stop fornicating? When are you stop, going to stop pursuing other, husband, other uh, people's wives? When are you going to stop pursuing other people's daughters? You have been defiling them after the other. When, when are you going to stop this? When are you going to stop embezzling? When are you going to stop telling lies? When are you going to stop holding malice? Malice has scattered your home. And yet, you, you are a Christian. You are coming to church. Nobody can talk to you. You say, as for that woman, forget about her. She, I cannot forgive her. I cannot do this. You are holding a grudge and malice. If Jesus comes and catches that with you, but the father is pulling back. I wish that I have one son there in Australia that I don't want to go to hell, but he has refused to repent. Let's give her a little more time. That's all that is keeping him holding Jesus back. The Lord is not slack. It's not that he doesn't have a sense of timing. It is his love, his passion, his mercy that keeps pulling him back. Just keep, he keeps waiting. I wish. Let's wait a little bit more in case somebody will repent. And uh, God is wishing somebody will repent tonight. Somebody will hand over his life to Jesus tonight. Somebody will break 
this, this vicious cycle of sin in his life tonight. Somebody will decide that from today, I am not going to be a candidate of hell any longer. That's Jesus' desire. That's why he keeps holding back. God is not slack at all. Look at verse, verse 10 finally. He said, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with half a day heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That's going to happen. It's in the scripture. And not a jot or tittle of this that we are reading is ever to go unfulfilled. A day is coming when the lightning will break the sky. And the Son of Man will show, he will descend with the shout of the archangel. It's going to happen. And I know it's sooner than it ever was before. Even if it doesn't come for another 100 years, definitely we are closer to it now than when I was born. We are closer to it now than when I was born again. I cannot guarantee you that it will be another 10 years, it will be another 20 years. And if you are a student of prophecy, you know there are many things that we are waiting for have already happened. The coming of the Lord can be at any time now. And yet, the only reason why he keeps holding himself back is your salvation. The only reason why he keeps holding himself back from coming is that you will at least repent and join the company of those who are eagerly looking to his coming. That's what is holding him back. Let me finish as I'm going to ask you to pray soon. Let me finish by going to the story we read yesterday. The story of the 10 pounds that was delivered to each, to each of those uh, uh, servants. Yesterday, we were looking at the, the servants. But there was another set of character in that story that we skipped over yesterday. You remember. Let's go to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Is it Luke chapter 17 that we read? No, it was chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. And we, we read from verse 11. I will read quickly again as, as I check just another set of character in that story. And as he had these things, he added and spake a parable because he was near to Jerusalem. And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. That's the thing that troubles people. The tendency to throw away the thought of the king's coming because he did not come immediately. He did not come as quickly as we think. He said, therefore, he told them this parable. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. He's coming back. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. And said to them, Occupy till I come. Verse 14 is where I want to emphasize before I call you to, to pray tonight. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. There are the servants, there are the citizens. Both of them are expecting the coming. Yesterday, we talked about those of us who are his servants, those of us who collected 10 pounds from him, those of us who have been born again, we have a relationship with the king, and the king could give us the things to utilize for his kingdom. That's what we talked about yesterday. But then it is possible that you are listening to me. You are not really a servant of God. You are not a child of God yet. You don't have anything, you don't have a relationship with the king yet. You are just a citizen of his country. Those whom he is ruling over. And look at what, what happened to this group of people. They sent a message after Jesus. We will not have you to rule over us. And if you look at the world today, the world is not about to submit to the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. The world is becoming more and more hostile to the gospel. More and more hostile to Christianity. They are twisting and twisting everything that makes the gospel gospel. The world is going... Hey, why? The definitions that we used to know when I was a young, when I was a young boy, a, a man is a man, a woman is a woman, 
Now, there are more sexes. There are people now who say, uh, even though I was born with the, with the male organs, but I think I ought to be a woman. And they can change their sex. They say they are transgender. Things that are unheard of. It looks like the world is going crazy, going against God's definition. Definition of marriage now used to be between a man and a woman. Now, a man and a man is marrying. And they call that civilization. They call that growth. They call that uh, 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 progress. There's only one reason. They hate it. They don't want to follow his ordinance. They don't want to follow the master. Gay is not new. It's been in the Bible. God has said some people will leave the natural use of the woman. And men and men are burning in their loss to one another. It's been there all along. But we are now seeing it practically legalized in the world system because the citizens, they hate Christ. And the simple way to know somebody who hates Christ is that they, they keep telling themselves, we will not have this man to rule over us. His principles will not rule over us. We will not obey his commandment. We are not going to subject ourselves to it. Maybe as I am talking, you are thinking of the one world government. You are thinking about the world civilization. You are thinking about those big, big things. Can I bring it home down to you? Anybody who will not submit to the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ is one of the citizens that are hating. Anybody who will not obey his commandments, very simple. Live according to how Jesus wants you to live your life. When you say no, all this uh, old school gospel, they just want to put people in bondage. Let's be free. We can dress anywhere you, we like and come to church. We can do whatever we like. We will not have this man rule over us. You are a citizen of the country. By your life, by your behavior, you are telling Jesus, you will not reign over me. You will not rule over me. I will not. You are going to receive authorization to, to return, but you will not return. Actually, there are people. Some of them are in church. Some of them are listening to me in this convention now. You are living your life in such a way as to tell the master, I don't believe you are coming back. You are not, we are not going to allow you in this place. There is no space for you and your kind of uh, Christianity in this place. There is no space for Jesus here. We have our own rules. We have our own uh, rules of engagement. There are United Nations charters that are ruling us. There are, there, are, there are many things that you are submitting yourself to now that are contrary to the will of God and contrary to the commandments of God. God. Listen, the citizens, they sent a message. They said, we will not have this man to rule over us. If you are listening to me tonight, in whatever shape or form, if you either in your thoughts, in your, in, your, in your words, in your speech, in your thoughts, or in your action, if you are living a life that seems to say, I will not be subject to the principles of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are one of the citizens that hates the king. But let me tell you, the king is coming. He's returning. When he comes, he's going to make a separation. There's a way he deals with his servants. We saw the way he, saw, he dealt with them. He deleted with them as, as, a, as according to the gifts he gave them and what they used it to accomplish. But the citizens... There's a simple way he did them. Look at how he dealt with them. That Luke chapter 19. Look at what happened. How did, what, what did he do to them? We'll finish and we, we read verse 14. Let's jump all the story about the 10 pounds and all the servants and go to where he spoke to the citizens again. Go to verse 27. He said, but those my enemies which will not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Wow. What a, what, a, what a tragic end to any man who will not submit to the reign and rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ. Excuse me. You can be psychedelic. You can become intelligent. You have become a professor now. 
you are you are you have gone beyond all those archaic biblical principles that you people are are using to haunt us. No problem. The king is coming, and when he comes, there was no discussion. Excuse me, there's no discussion with the sinner. The only thing coming from the king to the sinner is judgment. The Bible says it is appointed for man to die only once. After that, the judgment. If the master comes before you die, you face the judgment. If you die before the master comes, you face the judgment. There is no appeal. There is no discussion with the citizens that will not allow the master to rule and reign over them. There is no discussion. There is no bargaining. There is no opportunity for you to explain. Bring them. Slay them before me. That's the verdict. And tonight, I wish Jesus will reach to your heart as you are listening to me. You are asking yourself, am I living my life in submission to the king? Will the king be happy with my life? Or I'm just pursuing the cravings of my heart. I'm just living my own life. I'm just wanting to do things my own way. I've, I've, I've struggled over the years. And I've decided I cannot, I cannot submit myself. Some of you, you have divorced your first, the second wife. You have job, you are a serial polygamist. You have gone from one woman to another woman to another woman to another woman. Every one of them, none of them meets your standards. And yet, the Bible is very clear. Don't keep turning around, jumping from woman to woman like that. And you are listening to me today, but you are in church. Maybe because nobody has challenged you and asked you to make a decision. Tonight, at, on the occasion of this convention, when we are talking about the coming of the king, don't let him catch you red-handed like this. If he comes and you have not repented, there's no discussion. Bring them, slay them. My prayer is that that will not be your portion. Before we start, our daddy will still come now to come and minister to us and to pray for miracles and pray for blessings, I want you to check your life. Am I under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ? The way I'm living my life, is he happy with me? Am I behaving the way you will want me to behave? That's the question I want you to check. And there's a chance tonight for you to give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, for you to submit yourself to his rulership, to submit to his authority, to submit yourself to the principles of the word of God. Only those who submit themselves, they are the ones that can have a reward. All those who hate him and will not submit to his authority, there is only one party and one judgment for them. Bring them and slay them. In the same way, it's very consistent. In the days of Noah, bring them, finish them with the, slug, with the flood. In the days of Sodom, bring them, finish them with the fire. We don't, the issue is not first how God is going to destroy the earth. We already saw it. Fervent heat. Everything is going to melt. But you can save yourself from this untoward generation. You can save yourself from being a part of the citizens that hate the master. You can say, Lord Jesus Christ, I surrender. I will live according to your way. I will follow you from today. I will give my heart to you. I will live according to your principles. And he will receive. He said, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I will not reject anyone that comes to me. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall open his heart, I will come in, I will sup with him, I will with him. He will be my child, and I will be his God. God is offering that invitation to you tonight so that you can join us. To be a partaker of all the blessings in reality. For you to be a servant that can receive reward from his hand. The issue is that you must become his own first. You must not be a citizen. One of those citizens that hate him. I would like to call you tonight to give your life to Jesus. I would like to challenge you to make a turn for God. It doesn't matter where you live. There are people living in that place and they are pleasing God. God has never left himself without a witness. Don't say, it's not possible where I am. Excuse me, it's possible. There are people living in Australia. There are people living in America. There are Chinese. There are Indians. There are Hindus. People who used to be Hindus, who are living according to the will of God. God has a witness in every nation. Will you be one of those? 
bow down your heads with me and begin to pray. Lord, I want to hand over my life to you. I want to follow your way. I want you to rule over me. I will not rebel. Speak to the Lord tonight. Stand up on your feet and call upon him and say, Lord Jesus, I want to live with, with you. I want to live according to your will. I want to be subject to your, to, to, to your rule. I want to be one of your servants. I don't want to be one of those citizens. that live. If you are not a servant, you are a citizen. It's your choice. But Lord, I choose tonight. I choose to submit to you. I choose to re re remove all the sinful acts that I've been engaging in. And I choose tonight to break off my sins with acts of righteousness. Father, please have mercy on me. Talk to the Lord tonight. Pray. Open your mouth and call upon him and say, Lord Jesus, save my soul. Lord Jesus, deliver me from the oppression of sin. You may be there and you say, I used to be a Christian. I used to walk with him, but the society around me has persuaded me that it's not necessary. Lord, tonight I recommit myself. I, I'm a backslider. Receive me back into your, your kingdom. Receive me back into your hands. Tonight, Lord, make me a new creature in Christ Jesus. Let your spirit come and live inside me. I, am, I agree to submit yourself, myself to your rule. Speak to him tonight. He is ready and willing to hear you. As many as call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. All those who bow to him, he will come in. He will turn your life around and will make you a new creature. Your life will begin to bring a sweet smelling savour to his nostrils from tonight. I'm going to pray with you before I hand over again to our pastor who will administer all our decisions. All those who want to give their life to Jesus, I want you to make a decision tonight. Can you come to the altar wherever you are and say, Lord Jesus Christ, I want to signify. I don't want to do it in the crowd. I don't want the devil to think that I am still on his side. Stand up from wherever you are. Walk, walk towards the altar and call upon the Lord and say, save me tonight. Just take a step and walk so that when God is going to be looking at you, say, this one is not a citizen that hates me any longer. This one is one of my children. This one is one of my servants. I'm going to hand, hand over at this point. I'm going to ask our pastor, Pastor Astro, to please take over and lead these ones to Christ and get them to pray, get them to commit themselves. Ushers are going to come around you and going to give you a decision slip. Don't, tell, don't say, I have been a Christian for long. I don't want to come out so that people will see me. If you are still living in sin, he that committed sin is of the devil. That's what the Bible says. Break away from sin tonight. Step out and say, I am going to make a decision. I'm going to make a public declaration. And I'm going to turn myself over to the control and the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray with you before I hand you over to the pastor. Father, look at all those who are making decisions to you tonight. All those who are breaking away from the life of sin, who are stepping forward and asking that their lives will be touched, their lives will be turned around. Thank Lord, you. the heart is desperately wicked. Mm -hmm. Nobody can know it. But you are capable of turning the heart. The blood of Thank Jesus you. washes you. and cleanses you. our soul from sin. Yes. Lord, as many as are making this decision tonight, please, Lord, wash their soul. Amen. Clean. Let the blood of the Lamb, the blood that speaketh better things than. Thank you, Jesus. Shall we please rise up on our feet as we continue to?